So here we go. Here's our pretty little graphic of stellar evolution. And here is the HR diagram of stellar evolution. And you know, the HR diagram is very similar to uh, the periodic table of the elements. I actually call this the periodic table of the stars. If you understand the periodic table of the elements, you can look at any element on there. You can find a new element and see where it's placed on the HR, on, on the, on the, uh, on, in the periodic table of the elements, and you know absolutely everything there is to know about that element. Its position in the periodic table tells you everything there is to know about that particular element. Well, the same thing takes place with the HR diagram. It is a plot of absolute magnitude versus temperature. So at the top we have temperature, at the bottom we have the spectral class, because the spectral classifications of stars, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, R, N, S, etc., etc., there are way more categories uh, of stellar classification than we show on the HR diagram, because we only need these to show the vast majority of what takes place as stars cycle through their phases. So we have temperature, we have spectral class, same thing. We have absolute magnitude, and sometimes they use luminosity instead. Absolute magnitude is the intrinsic brightness of a star, how bright it actually is internally. Not its apparent brightness or how bright it appears to be from here, but its actual intrinsic brightness. Or sometimes it's plotted as a luminosity. That's a totally arbitrary scale. Uh, simply, the sun is one solar uh, luminosity, and everything else is more or less luminous than the sun. So when you plot temperature versus uh, magnitude, you end up with the main sequence where stars are fusing hydrogen to helium, and you have a, quote, normal star. Uh, and then when they start to transition off the HR diagram, when they run out of uh, hydrogen in their core, core hydrogen, and they start to evolve. And they evolve either up from the lower part of the branch to the giant branch, that's what the sun will do. If you look at this HR diagram and you look where the G class is, and you go up to one solar luminosity, that's where the sun sets on, on the main sequence of the HR diagram. So when it runs out of hydrogen in its core and starts to fuse heavier and heavier elements, it will start to transit transition up through what's called the Myra instability strip, be on the red giant branch for a while while it pulsates and ends up um, producing carbon for its last element and then collapses into the white dwarf and the planetary nebula. More massive ones transition from the top of the main sequence over to the supergiant and giant, supergiant branch and they also will transition through as we will see, because this is what we're focusing on for 2018, these massive stars, they also are some instability strips up there, depending upon the mass of the star, that they are going to transition through. So here, are the, this is the area that we're worried about this year, concerned about, that you, the students, uh, are prepared, because uh, we're only now, this is March that I'm recording this, so we're getting close to national competition. State competitions are going on, so everybody's learning uh, all of the, this information now to prepare for hopefully winning their state competition and going on to nationals. So up in that part, the, in the more massive part of the HR diagram, there are three instability strips. Um, the Cepheid instability strip, the semi-regular, and the blue luminous variables. Now, as stars transition, through those regions on the HI diagram, they are evolving from one stage of stellar evolution to another stage of stellar evolution. And while they are doing that, they are producing, they, their, their brightness is varying over time. So if you, if you record that change and produce the light curve, you will see a light curve that's pretty much specific to that specific area of instability from the, the blue luminous variables, also sometimes called the asteratus instability strip up there, you can see that it's very different than the other two. There are every now and then, because these, these stars are so incredibly massive, they last such a short amount of time, astronomically speaking, 
that every now and then they throw off mass ejections of materials. And you can see all of a sudden there'll be a huge curve. And they could have collapsed then, but somehow or other they managed to keep going. And eventually they will uh, undergo a really catastrophic um, collapse. So here is how you can use these card sets to give you a good understanding of stellar evolution. I'm going to start out with images only from the card set itself, and then I'm going to add in objects from the 2018 Deep Sky Object List and add those to the card set to show you how your students should prepare to understand stellar evolution. So I'm starting with some basic cards. What I do is now, I, I do this every now and then I go to a, a science Olympiad coaches clinic that gives me extra time and I can actually go through these time sets, the, the, these, time se these sequences of deep sky objects and it's amazing that the coaches really get an understanding of of stellar evolution and they actually become, because I've had several coaches come up and whisper this to me, I'm no longer afraid. They see that stellar evolution is not some big scary, oh my goodness, this is astrophysics, you know, how can I ever help my students understand this? It is not that difficult, okay? It really is not. So hopefully, if you're fearful of this particular event, this will help you too. So. What I do is um, I hand out a series of cards, see, cards, a whole bunch, the entire set, and have the participants pull out the numbers that I ask them to pull out. In this case, they've got the entire card set, and they're going to pull out numbers 2, 6, 7, 9, 10, 21, and 23. Okay, so I do this, I've been doing this also at NSTAs for the last 20 plus years. And with all the external evaluations that come into the Chandra um, website as they do their evaluations, this is the single most all-time favorite activity uh, that for classroom teachers. So it works really, really well. It's been well tested. So we're going to start out with a mid-sized star, like the sun. Think of the sun. So. What you have to remember as you go along is that the sequence I have up here might not, you, someone else might do it a different way and it might still be correct. Um, what I like about astrophysics is there's never any one specific answer. There are choices, uh, some of them better than others, but there is a lot of variety. And these cards, these sequences can be put together in many different ways, not one necessarily being better than the other. So the students discuss in groups, teams, whatever. They go through and they arrange these, these numbered images into a sequence that they think represents from formation to destruction a star like the sun. So then I put them up one at a time. I ask them, what's first, what's first, and I'll get a variety of answers, and then I will put this one up, and we will go through the entire sequence. So I have 7, 2, 21, 9, 23, and 6, and 10. Okay, so what have we here? Well, we have a star formation region. That's a Hubble image of M16, the Eagle Nebula. Then we have a Chandra X-ray artist illustration of a protostar. And yes, there are actual images of protostars, depending upon your audience, how basic you want to begin. If you're working with middle school students, you probably want to use the illustration first, because a lot of middle school students don't understand yet that a bright white thing is actually a protoplanetary system. This brown smudgy thing is a protoplanetary system. So you can you pull out and use any of the cards you want. There are more high-end technical cards that are more basic cards depending upon your audience. Then 21 is an image of the Sun. It is a SOHO image, so it's an extreme ultraviolet image of the Sun but from the SOHO mission. 
Uh, number nine is a NASA illustration of a red giant because our sun is going to go through the red giant stage and then it is going to collapse into a, a white dwarf in a planetary nebula. The only difference between 23 and 6 is that the material in 6 has spread further away from the white dwarf in the center. So 23 is a younger planetary nebula than number 6. Uh, both of those are Hubble images. Um, number 6 is the 8 burst nebula, which is one of my favorite planetary nebulas of all time. And number 10 is a McDonald's Observatory optical image of a white dwarf. Now, a really important part of the astronomy event is multi-wavelength images. And if you've been doing Science Olympiad for a while, you understand that multi-wavelength is really, really important because every single wavelength that's produced by one of these objects is produced by a different process. And you cannot understand what's going on with a deep sky object until you see what's going on that's producing the optical radiation, what's producing the X-ray radiation, the ultraviolet, the infrared. You need to see all the different wavelengths and how they all fit together coming from various and different parts of the deep sky object to understand it. So, as because for instance, that image of a white dwarf is an optical image. Now, it's Sirius B. Now, Sirius B is a multiple star system, and it has a, a companion star. So the white dwarf, Sirius B, has a companion star, Sirius A. Well, white dwarfs radiate really poorly in optical. So in this particular image, 10, the dim one you can barely see next to the bright one, that's the white dwarf, not the big white one. Now, if this was an x-ray image, and I also have a Chandra x-ray image in this card set, it's just the opposite. The big purpley bright one is the white dwarf, and the dim, dim one is the companion star, just the opposite because different things are going on at different radiation wavelengths that are being emitted from these objects. So let us now put a simple scenario together for a more massive star, like the 2018 event. So this time they pull out numbers 2, 4, 7, 12, 15, 19, and 37. So again, we can start out exactly the same, because I have the same two images to begin with. So we know that's a stellar formation region, and we know that's a protoplanetary system. So then I have 19, 37, 12, 15, or 4. Now this is an example to show you that sometimes these images can be placed on top of or on bottom of each other. They can be arranged in a circle. There are several different ways that you can arrange these, these images. And what we have here is, again, uh, starting with 19, we have a da David Malin, um, from the who used to be with the Anglo-Australian Anglo Telescope in Australia. That's the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is an open cluster of bright, young, hot stars. So they're massive young stars. And then the next one is also a David Malin um, astrophotograph, and that is Antares. And Antares uh, is in the constellation of Scorpio, and it happens to be a red supergiant. And next we have Puppis A, as is a Chandra image of a type 2 supernova remnant. And type 2 supernova remnants can contain either a pulsar which is number 15, a pulsar, Chandra X-ray image of a pulsar, or it can be a black hole. And again, uh, this black hole is an illustration, an artist illustration of a black hole, but there are actually images in there of actual images of black holes, because the Chandra mission has imaged many of those. So this gives you an idea of how you arrange the images in a sequence 
to show the stages of stellar evolution using specific objects. So now, let's look again at the deep sky objects for 2018. We have two star formation regions. We have those four um, massive stars. We have the five type two supernovas, and we have pulsars, three different pulsars. So let's add them to the sequence now. Now I used to put together what I would call flashcard sets, and I stopped doing that for a very specific reason. I still mention them in the webinars as a resource for students to learn to have them put together their own flashcard sets of the deep sky objects for any given year. Because you're going to learn more if you do it yourself than if I do it for you. So, and, and, and I realized that they were being used only as a flashcard set. You know, you put the information on the back and you just show the card and you know, they, your partner tells you all the information that's on the back of it. And I, I realized, I, I didn't think that was very productive because on the PowerPoints um, that I post that on all of these webinars, the PowerPoints have a link directly to the best place to read and, and learn about that particular object. So you don't really need to learn that information off the back of a card. It's much better if you use those cards with the same sequencing that we've already been doing with the basic stellar evolution card set. So here, for instance, are three slides where I've just put together some of the objects from the 2018 deep sky objects, understanding that I could put together a card set here that would have easily 100 objects in it because there are so many different images for each object. You know, you could, for instance, um, if we look here, uh, number B on this first one, that's W49B, uh, type 2 supernova remnant, that's a Chandra image. Uh, there is optical images, infrared images, Chandra images, several different Chandra images because they've looked at it and observed it from a, from a, from a lot of different perspectives. So there are several other images, so never ever get locked in on one particular image. Use a variety. So here is the first slide that has some of the deep sky objects for 2018. 